scatter box. Okay, so first, just the basics of what a polynomial is. A polynomial is p of x is just a function of x that has only like non-negative integral problems. So, for example, uh, this is a polynomial. Usually, we deal with polynomials that are in R of x, which means that all of the AI are all real numbers. <clears throat> and polynomials are very nicely behaved creatures. And we'll like look at a lot of interesting things you can prove about them. So like some examples of polynomials for the sake of sounding normal, this is a polynomial. A constant polynomial is also a polynomial and like literally zero is also a polynomial. And if P of something, say R is zero, then R is a root of the polynomial. And we have that this polynomial can be written as X minus R into some other polynomial Q of X. I'm assuming all of these things is fairly basic. So I'm going quickly over them. If you have any questions, do stop me and ask. And in general, if anything's not clear, just ask. And we will take the fundamental theorem of algebra for granted, which states that any polynomial, real polynomial, can be factorized into a bunch of uh, linear factors, as well as a bunch of quadratics. So essentially, you can factor it into a bunch of polynomials such that everything has degree at most two, two and all of the coefficients are real. <clears throat> so let's just begin with this, I think, quite a famous thing. Let's see. You're supposed to find all real polynomials. with a degree at most three, such that P of one is one, P of two is two, P of three is three, and P of four is four. Like, if any of you know how to do this or want to try, go ahead. Consider the polynomial P of X minus X. Sorry, could you repeat your voices quite low? Oh, sorry. Uh, consider the polynomial p of x minus x. Okay. Hmm. So the thing gives us that it has four roots. Yes, for all then, x being 1, 2, 3, 4, this thing is equal to 0. Yeah, hmm. but then decrease at most 3, so it must be 0 polynomial. Yes, this polynomial also. Okay, I just mention that this highest thing here is called the degree of the polynomial. Yes, yeah, so this has a degree at most three, but because it's zero on all of these values we must have that it can be written as x minus 1 into x minus 2 into x minus 3 into x minus 4 into some other stuff. But this means the degree is at least 4 over here. So the whole thing must just be 0 itself. 
And so we have that P of X is in fact just equal to X. And a common fact that's very usually useful is that if uh, P of X minus Q of X is zero for uh, like degree P, so that's of degree P and degree Q values, then uh, P is in fact equal to Q. And by the same argument as what we just did, you can say that because this thing has degree at most the maximum of P and Q. But we have that for uh, more than these many values, we have that they're both equal, so they must just be equal overall. Does that make sense? Max plus one, right? Yeah, the plus one was just added and it's somewhat illegible. Yes. Okay, so let's do another similar thing. Find all polynomials of degree at most two and such that uh, P of one is two, P of two is three, and P of three is four. Same thing with x plus one. Yes. So like uh, define gx equals P of x minus x minus one. Yes, uh, G is. So G has three roots. Yeah. But its degree is less than or equal to two. So it has to be the zero polynomial. Yes. So, but the advantage we had in these cases was that P of these stuff is just very nice. And you could just observe the pattern. Suppose the problem was uh, degree is at most four. And uh, we have P of zero is 2022. 20, P of one is 10,000. P of two is not, P of two is one. P of three is five and P of four is minus 32. Can you find all the polynomials that satisfy this? Uh, we can try Gaussian method here, but I guess it's a bit messy. We, we can try what? Gaussian method of solving equations. Oh, yes. So you can suppose that P of X is a naught plus a one x plus a two x square and so on and then whatever a four x to the four. You have five equations, five variables, and yeah, you can just solve it. But like the yeah, no, interpolation, not like the interpolation. Yes, yes, like yes that's what p is two thousand twenty two into x minus one into x minus two and so on. Hmm. into x minus three into x minus four by zero minus one by uh, 0 minus 2 by 0 minus 3 by 0 minus 4 plus 10,000 into x minus 0 and so on. Yes, Data exactly. Data. Like to those of you who don't know this, like this is how I wanted to introduce it. So like obviously you can solve these equations, but like we are nice people who don't want to do such things. So we'll actually directly create this polynomial. So the idea is this. Suppose that we have that P of A1 is B1, P of A2 is B2, and so on. P of An is equal to Bn. <clears throat> and we have that its degree is at most n minus 1. Then we claim that's actually a unique polynomial. And that we'll actually just find this polynomial. And how are we going to do that? So the idea is this, we'll consider
So if you look at what I've written, this product involves everything except x minus a1. This product involves everything except x minus a2. And this involves everything except x minus a3. And we're actually just going to write this on until you have the only one term missing. That's x minus a n that's missing. Are you trying to use CRT in some way? CRT? Yes, I guess kind of. You're just taking two things in. Yeah, I guess kind of. So suppose we put uh, x equal to a1. Oh, we'll just call this expression e, like standing for expression. What does this become? Uh, the last exception would be, I guess, x minus a1, x minus a2. Yes. So if we put x as a1 in this strange looking expression, what do we get? Only the first term. Yes, because every other term here has a factor of x minus a1. So every other factor that's here, all of it just becomes zero. So the only thing that's going to remain is the first term. And this is very nice because if we put x equal to a2, then every term is going to die because this, there's an x minus a2 in all of them, except this, this one. This, con this construction is somewhat similar to CRT. CRT you construct as in? Like this construction of all numbers. Okay, yes, I guess. So yeah, that's the idea that when X is AI, only the ith term remains and it's equal to, uh, we have that if E is a polynomial of X, then we have that E of AI is just equal to a product of like AI minus A1, AI minus A2, and so on like AI minus AI minus one. And does everyone agree with this? Yes. Yeah, so, but the problem is we wanted this to be equal to BI and not this. So how do we fix that? Using the fact that whenever you put the ith term only, I mean, when you put AI, only the ith term remains. So anything you do to other terms doesn't affect it. Also, like, don't directly message me, just send to everyone. It'll be easier that way. So, yes, so now what Nana said is correct. Instead of having just this expression, we'll actually multiply this by B1 and divide by a1 minus a2, a1 minus a3, and so on until a1 minus a m. And we'll repeat the same thing here. b2 and divide by but for large and it becomes really calculated. Yes, yes. This is not necessarily a good method to actually find it. I'm just saying that 
there exists a direct formula for it. You don't necessarily need to solve the equation. It is nice for somewhat degree when it is smaller than five or six, something yeah. greater than that. Is for small, if the degree is small enough, then yeah, this is nice. But yes, for bigger, it's just very weird and ugly to do. But most of the times you won't actually have to explicitly calculate this out. Sometimes just the fact that knowing there exists such a polynomial is very useful. And sometimes you'll just want to look at the leading coefficient of this and so on. So you, mostly you'll probably like never have to actually use the fact that you can explicitly calculate this out. You'll probably never have to do that. Just the fact that this exists is useful. So what adding this extra stuff did is that now when you put x equal to a1, every other term as we discussed just goes to zero. I mean, it becomes zero, not goes to zero. And this thing cancels out all the stuff here. And the only thing that's left is a b. Now, if you put x as a2, then this, this, all of these things, they all just become zero because that's a factor of x minus a2. So the only thing that doesn't have a factor of x minus a2, when you put it here, it all cancels and you're just left with a b. So that's just nice that, and because we are mathematicians, like we, we insist on being fancy for not necessarily a good reason. So we'll just write it like this. So it's the exact same thing that we've written above. These x minus aj things just being all where j goes from everything from one to n, just excluding i, because that's important. Otherwise, this term would just be zero always. And we're just dividing by the ai minus aj, so that whenever we put x equal to ai, all the stuff is just going to cancel, and we'll just be left with the f of ai. And the degree of this thing is because the product is n minus one things. It has degree at most n minus one. So it satisfies the condition that we had over here. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And this thing is called as Lagrange interpolation. It's quite famously And it's especially useful in computational contests also. If you just have to like find polynomials, satisfying stuff. And yeah, I think like it's the algebraic equivalent of the Chinese remainder theorem, where you kind of put together, if you have a bunch of congruences, you can find a general solution to a congruence. That's kind of what Lagrange interpolation does. For each of those fact values of AI, you have some corresponding value of BI that you want the function to take. So you're just creating it in this way. It's quite similar, as Anurag mentioned. Okay, so like, were there any questions or doubts with that? If not, we'll move on to the next thing. I'll assume not then. Okay, so this thing, 
I don't know if it counts as a prerequisite, but we won't be using it that much. So I'll just mention it, I think. So like, there is this thing called a derivative. So if this polynomial is a naught plus a one x plus a n x to the n, its derivative, which is written as p dash of x, is equal to a one plus two a two x plus three a three x square and so on, plus n a n x to the n minus one. Essentially, for each term, the highest the power of x gets reduced by one, and you just move the exponent as like multiplying with the coefficient. So physically, the derivative denotes the rate of change of something. So for if, for example, our polynomial, suppose this is our polynomial looked, say, something like this. So if we're looking at the derivative, so if this is a point x here, this value is p of x, then p dash of x actually represents the slope of a tangent at this point. And in this case, when this tangent is horizontal, we have that uh, p dash of y, I guess, is equal to zero. We won't need anything about derivatives beyond just this. There's obviously a lot more about them. So like, just a simple, also, if the original polynomial had degree n, the derivative has degree n minus one. I think it's easy to see that. So like, let's just do a random problem. I'm not sure if you can even call it a problem, but like, but sort of this thing. If someone just gave this graph to you and said, what's the degree of this polynomial? What would you guess? Assume it's just like actually increasing beyond this it's point. It's three. It's three. Three? Like it has, uh, it has two turning points where the derivative is zero. So the degree of the uh, uh, derivative polynomial is three. Are you so sure? the polynomial itself would have degree three, uh, four. Yes. So there are three points here where this tangent becomes horizontal. Oh, I horizontal. have missed that third tangent. Point. Yeah. So this means that p dash of x has three roots at least. So this polynomial p of x, it's probably of degree four. Like obviously, I haven't given the entire graph, so you can't actually exactly say, but this is like a nice thing to know like an actual interpretation of the derivative. And also, it's not at all related, but I'll just mention this because I think it's a very common misconception. I think the definition of tangent that's in most people's heads is you just draw a line that intersects the graph exactly at one point, it's just like one intersection. This is actually surprisingly not true. Suppose we consider the graph of y equal to x cube, and it's like, it looks like this. Uh, yeah. Does anyone know what the tangent at zero is? Is, yes, it's just the x axis. So, and so it just literally like intersects the graph. And if you pick it at this point, it even intersects the graph at a later point. 
So a tangent is not just something that intersects the graph once, but for most purposes, it's like a good enough definition or like good enough way to think about. So I guess we'll get to the first actually like challenging problem. Let's see. Also, just to confirm, like, what are you people seeing on the screen right now? Like, blank. Okay. I see polynomials. Yeah, just okay, nice. I was just confirming that like, the other tab was not Yes, that's, that's a really nice problem. Actually, like, I'll not even say anything about this. Like, just think about it and, like, what this weird looking condition even means. Like, just think about it. And I'll just be back in.
Okay, so any ideas, like anything you think about the problem? It looks weird, it looks stupid, it's trivial in one way, anything? Well, it does look sus, like, if you let x equals n plus epsilon mm -hmm. for some integer n. Right. So uh, let's assume this is an integer n. Yeah. And this is x over here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So let's say that is one of the solution to that. Hmm. So suppose the p of n is here. Right. Differences at most. Differences? Yes, uh, epsilon is less than one. So like floor of x is... Yeah. So if we do that, you get like p of n equals floor of p of n plus epsilon. Yes, so what the problem is saying is that if you look at p of x, actually if you consider this box here, this is p of n plus one it's saying that uh, p of x where x is between n and n plus one so all we know is that it goes this graph if it's something like i don't know this it at some point comes up into this box. So if that's a solution to this equation, it means that there is a value inside this box. Does everyone agree with that? Because uh, if something is here, then floor of that P of X will be equal to P of yes. X, which is P of floor of So the graph looks something like this. Uh, <clears throat> but the very interesting fact is that there are exactly n real solutions, which is a finite number. So can something like, suppose like the graph I've drawn, can it work for the problem? No, like the graph can't go downward the blue line. Why not? Uh, because then uh, it will move to P of N minus one. Ah, so like the solution to X is here. We're not saying that everything in this interval satisfies that. We're oh. saying that if it's in this box, then it satisfies. Also, how do we get it? It's in that box thing. Ah, so you want floor of p of x to be equal to p of floor of x, right? Yeah. So if n is floor of x, then it has to lie between p of n and p of n plus one. Okay, yeah, yeah, fine. And it's between n and n plus one, yeah. so it's in this box that's been treated. And also the fun part about this problem is that we'll almost never really use any polynomial-ish facts. We'll mostly just be looking at how this graph looks. So it's nice. It can't go above. It can at most touch. Why not? Because otherwise we'd have some like content, like dense section of solutions. Yeah. So, yes. So that's point is that if you have something of this sort, then there are infinitely many values here, like this, 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 and so on. And all of these are solutions to this equation. But we were told that there are only n such solutions. So, in fact, the polynomial can't come like this and go. So in this, uh, in such a box, they can be at most like 
endpoints in there for the functions that you yes there can be at most 10 such boxes but the problem is that if it actually like goes through the box then there are infinitely many points inside then there are tending points there for sure tending point like tending point is a point says that f dash of x is equal to zero yes so yeah so the polynomial suppose it's something it can never actually cross over and come the essentially there can never be a point inside this box because if there is such a point then this graph like must be something in its neighborhood right and all of this neighboring point should also be in the box and so we have infinitely many solutions which can't happen so the only other possibility is that any such point must be there also krishna said that it has to intersect the box only at this point but there is another possibility of this happening it's a bit too sharp i think yes something like this and we know that it can't go about the line because if it goes about the line then we have infinite in human solutions yes it can never go above the line so essentially when it's just touching it's just barely in the box does that make sense yes and also we're over here we're assuming that x is not an integer if x is an integer then there's no problem because if the box is like this the graph can just look like this or some i just don't get what this yeah the graph can just look like this right like it never has to even come up and touch like this itself this integer point is also a solution do you all agree yes it is yeah so if like if not then yeah then we also have these kinds of weird solutions that can happen and also like you can probably phrase this another way but let's just assume that the polynomial has degree smaller than 2n plus 1 by 3 so i guess i can there is a generalization that for the real number x the solutions p of x should be an integer right because if yes. it is an integer it is not yes so because it can never actually cross into the box for any such solution yes it must be an integer and it's equal to p of n and also i didn't specifically mention this but p of n is also an integer because it's equal to floor of something so that's essentially like all that's there to understand about the equation now it's just about using polynomial facts i mean in the sense using polynomial stuff using the graph that we just created so we have like a bunch of such boxes like this the touches goes on the stuff so if you notice it's like a very weird characterization it's saying that whenever p of an integer is an integer the other extra solutions you can have are like it just has to come up touch and go which and you're asked to show that the degree is at least something so in this current graph like do you know of any way to like say that the degree must be high in between those like zero tangent points we get loads of them if there are non integer solutions exactly so we assume that there are non integer solutions the other case will also deal with so at this point there's a horizontal tangent 
like one, two, three, four, and over here. So let's actually just create some notation for this convenience. Let's say that uh, I is the set of all and just pick a letter more things for non integer okay just n for the set of all non integer solutions so let's assume that n has quite a few stuff in it so suppose this set n it has size say k so what can we say about the degree of p based on this uh at least how many times must it turn K is the size of the non-integer solution. Is K size of yes. n? Okay, then two yeah. plus one. Yes. So it's for every non-integer solution that's there. It has to like from down, it has to come up. So there's one turning point there. And at this point itself, there is another turning point. So for every non-integer solution, you have at least two roots for P dash of X. So from that, we get that um, p dash of x has at least two k roots. So we have that degree of p is at least two k plus one, two k plus one. But we assumed what, like what, according to the if the problem is false, what must degree of p be less than? Like um, the problem asks to show that the degree of P is at least 2n plus 1 by 3. It's, it's less than 2n. Yeah, so we'll, we're assuming that it's less than 2n plus 1 by 3. Because if not, we would be done. So what does this give? So we have that the size of n is at most this. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Yeah, so what we showed was that there can't be too many of these non-integer solution. There's like at most n minus one by three of them. So this means that because I plus N, like all of them are together N solutions. So what do we know about the size of I? If, uh, and we know this. Can we say anything about uh, size of pi is greater than two n plus n by three? Yes. So I guess that... it's not possible. Why not? Like I denote the set of all integer solutions, right? Yeah. And we have like n at most n such solutions so you're right but why 
I guess I don't have much of formal definition. I will just think about that. So, if and I is actually nicer than n in the sense I is actually the set of all integers n. Maybe not n. All integers. What is another next letter? M. Such that. P of M is also an integer. So essentially the number of values for which P of something is an integer, like, I mean, sorry, I'm crazy. The number of solutions to P of X equal to Y, where this is integer and this is an integer. We are given that the number of such x is greater than 2n plus 1 by 3, which is by assumption greater than the degree of p. But by long the, range interpolation, we can't have it greater than degree of p, right? Yes, exactly. So could you elaborate on the Lagrange? Like we have n solutions to this beyond mm -hmm. uh, and we can we can just uh, use language interpolation and get that it has at most uh, p roots. Exactly. So we have a bunch of things like p of a one is p one, p of a two is b two, and so on until p of a, I'll say z is b z, where z is the size of i. Actually, let's not pick all Z of them. We can pick 2n plus 1 by 3. Because the size of Z, we assumed is greater than 2n plus 1 by 3. And by assumption, we also have that degree of P is less than 2n plus 1 by 3. So this means that by Lagrange interpolation, you can do stuff and get the polynomial. But what's the contradiction here? You just like manage to find the polynomial. If the contradiction is that it would have like a uh, two n plus one by three uh, roots greater than two n plus one by three roots. How would you say that? Like a uh, uh, we try to construct a polynomial so we so we get like in each term of the polynomial we would have like x minus b1 x minus b2 till x minus b2 n plus 1 by 3 right and uh, just note that the degree of each term will be like 2n minus ah, ah okay wait i see what you're saying yes, i should yes, clarify yes. this is a very common error if polynomial P and Q, suppose this has degree N and this has degree N, what is the degree of P plus Q? It's N. No, it N. can be zero also. Yes, P plus Q has degree at most N. You can have something like X bar N and like minus X bar N and degrees, that's fine. 1 minus x to the power n and the degree is zero. Or you could have like x cube minus x to the power n and degree is three. So all we know that if you're taking sum of things with equal degree, the degree is at most this because stuff might get canceled out. And in fact, let's actually just do this example to convince ourselves. Remember that example with p of one is one, P of 2 is 2 and P of 3 is 3. And let's assume degrees at most 2. <laughs> so suppose we actually do Lagrange interpolation. Do you think we'll get P of x equal to x or something else? Can you just repeat what you said? 
like we had that formula for Lagrange interpolation. If we use that formula, what polynomial will we get? Will we get P of X equal to X or will we get something else? X. X. Yes. So you have actually X one into X minus one, X minus two. Uh, what am I doing? So, so X minus two into X minus three to one by one minus two into one minus three plus two into x minus one into x minus three by two minus one into two minus three plus three into x minus one x minus two by three minus one into three minus two <clears throat> let's actually just expand this out and this is x squared minus 5x plus 6 by what, 2 plus 2 into x squared minus 4x plus 3 by minus 1 plus 3 into x squared minus 3x plus 2 by 2. <clears throat> and if you actually look at the coefficient of x squared, it becomes one by two minus two plus three by two, which is zero. So the X squared term actually gets canceled out. And like you can check the constant term is also gets canceled out. So you're actually left with just P of X equal to X. So yes, it's a good idea that Lagrange interpolation gives you this thing and it can look a bit misguiding. So like, it's just, well, it's just like clarify this thing. So we do get a polynomial that has degree less than two n plus one by three. We can't say that it will be exactly two n plus one by three minus one or something. Yeah, so what Krishna says is right. But what we can say is that According to this formula that we had here, let's find it. We have zoomed in a bit too much in some places. Yes, so this thing existed. So in our case, we know okay, this is just bi. So we know that all the AI and BI that we have are all integers. So what can you say about the polynomial of polynomial? What kind of coefficients can it have? It's a rational polynomial. Yes, all of its coefficients are rational. So we have that if the size of I is greater than two n plus, greater than the degree of P, then by Lagrange interpolation, we have that P of X is actually just a rational polynomial. Ah, rational polynomial is a terrible way of putting it because if you have like a quotient of two polynomials, that's a rational polynomial. It's of the form some integer polynomial by some big number, say, L, where this is an um, integer coefficient polynomial. Or does everyone agree with this? Yes. Can you please so, repeat, I was disconnected. Yeah, yeah. so uh, at what point were you disconnected? Uh, that mod of i is greater than 2n plus uh, 1 by 3. Okay, so we had that mod of i is greater than 2n plus 1 by 3, which is greater than the degree of p by assumption, right? Yes. So essentially, i is the set of all integers m such that p of m is also an integer. 
So yeah. if you have this many solutions in I, this means that you can find such things where all the AI and BI are integers, where A1, A2 and all are the elements of I. Do you agree? Yeah. So, and we know that degree of P is less than 2n plus 1 by 3. Yeah. So by Lagrange interpolation, we can just write out P and we'll see that everything has rational coefficients. Yes, okay, thanks. Got it. That's all we did. So essentially, all we're given is that P is an R of X. So it just has real coefficients. And we've showed that it actually must have all coefficients to be rational. <laughs> Wait, then L divides Q of X for like N values of X, right? 2N plus 1 by 3 values. It's not really much. Yes, yes. And we just subtract uh, subtract Q. Uh, we take the value Q of X minus L times any BI. BI? <laughs> what, what is BI? But like determining BI would be hard here. Uh, what do you mean by BI? Like BI is the solution, right? Oh, BI, I see. Yeah. Uh, also, I will mention that n into n plus 1 by 2. It is a polynomial with not integer coefficients, but it's always an integer if n is an integer. Like here, we just have infinitely many integers. Like if we put x as something that clears the denominator. Yes. That is the problem. That is the contradiction for this problem. But I'm saying like in general, if you have something with not integer coefficients, it can still be a integer for everybody. But yes, uh, can you repeat what you were saying, Sathar, for this? We can choose x such that it just clears all the denominators of each of the coefficients. And... Yes. So if suppose we had that q of a1 by l is an integer. Then we have that okay. Q of A1 plus L by L is also an integer. <clears throat> because like when you're adding L, if you just expand it out, everything will be divisible by L apart from the Q of A1 part. Does that make sense? Yes, so it's in contradiction. Because yes, of like it, yes. A1 plus M, L, I guess by L is all things. So we get that uh, I like, so like we have A1 is in I, A1 plus L is in I, A1 plus 2L is in I and so on. So we get that I actually has infinitely many elements, but we know it has at most N. So this is a contradiction. And that is it. So we are done with this problem. <clears throat> nice. So does everyone understand the proof or like, would you like me to just go over it once? Because it is a bit long. Yeah. Okay, so first we see that, suppose X is a solution with floor of X equal to N. Then we have this kind of box created by n n plus one and p of n and p of n plus one. And because p of n is equal to floor of p of x, it's an integer. And we saw that this graph of p, it can never go into the box because if it did, everything inside the box is a solution and there are infinitely more. But we were told there were exactly n, which is a finite number. So it can never actually go into the box. So if there are any non-integer solutions, they must all look kind of like this, where it just comes up, touches the line and goes back down. And then we saw that there can be at most 2n plus 1 by 3 integer solutions by this, what we just did. Because if there are more than that many integer solutions, 
then the set of all integer solutions is infinite because by Lagrange interpolation, P of X is a, a polynomial with rational coefficients. And we saw that I must be infinite, which is a contradiction. So I actually has to have size at most 2n plus 1 by 3. But then this means that n, the set of all non-integer solutions, it needs to have like at least n minus 1 by 3 things. But now the point is, if you look at p dash of x, the derivative, for every of these non-integer solutions, once before it, it turns, and at that non-integer value, it turns again. So each contributes at least two roots to p dash of x. So if there are k elements of i, where did we have this? Yes, if there are at least k elements in i, then we have that degree of p is at least 2k plus 1 because p dash of x has 2k roots. So from this, we get that k is actually less than n minus 1 by 3. But then we show that k, uh, the number of elements of n is less than n minus 1 by 3, and number of elements of i is less than 2n plus 1 by 3. So overall, there are like less than n solutions, which is a contradiction. I just phrased it slightly differently, but it's the same thing. Does everyone understand this? Yes. Like even if there's any doubt that you think might be even where fragile. exactly are we using two n plus one other than the finiteness? Other two n plus one as in two n plus one by three. Ah, other so, than the finiteness. Ah, we also needed it over here, where we used the fact that degree p have was less than two n plus one by three, but at least two k plus one. So we got some bound on k. Can that be changed instead of 2n plus 1, 3? 2n plus 1 by 3. I don't think you can improve the 2n plus 1 by 3. I don't know of any examples that satisfy this, but also the original, prop this is from uh, the Middle European Math Olympiad from this year. I've changed the wording so it looks shorter and cooler. But the original problem also asked to show that you can find such a polynomial for every value of n. So like, I'll just leave it as an exercise. You can try that. I'll just write it here. Uh, prove there exists P for every value of n. And not with degree 2n plus 1 by 3. I don't know if you can even achieve this. But like just any degree prove that you can find such a polynomial. And I'll just leave this an exercise. Also, after the class, I'll just send a bunch of problems. You can I'll try that. So I guess let's move on to the next stuff. OK. We have like, I think, around half an hour. Left, so let's do this thing. So the other very nice thing about polynomials is that although for small values there may be some variations but for sufficiently large values their value is approximately like very fixed that's very vague and strange i'll elaborate on what i mean suppose you have the polynomial like say this plus x to the four plus two x cubed minus thousand and i mean i don't know how the graph of this looks it will be a bit weird but the point is if you consider only values of x that are say greater than uh 10 to the 9 i don't know, like let's just assume it's greater than a billion then we can actually say that p of x is like around x to the 6 because for very large values of x this term just like dominates the other terms so we can in fact just approximate it with x to this approximation is a vague word because you can approximate it very badly obviously but 
in general, a very nice approximation for polynomials. If suppose the polynomial is a n, assume on for sanity, say a n minus one x to the n minus one plus stuff for sufficiently large, and by large, I mean in magnitude. So x being less than a negative billion, also, I'm counting is big. Am I trying to introduce a fundamental theorem of algebra? No, I will not do it. And also, I'm just, I'm just assuming the fundamental theorem of algebra. I can't prove it here. So P of X, you can actually like informally say is around this. Like if you expand this, the degree of N is going to be X to the N and the degree of N, uh, X to the N minus one is going to be A N, the coefficient. So, and the, and the rest of the polynomial, let's just say is some Q of X. Then the difference between this expression and this expression is actually going to become like very small. And in most cases, we can actually just like even ignore this part and just say it's approximately x to the n. If you don't even care about that word of an approximation. So this is nice because it's just an easier way of thinking about it, I think. Okay, so let's prove this fact, which might seem intuitively obvious, but it's just good to know that you can prove it. Suppose P is of degree n. Assume the leading coefficient is positive. Prove that there exists a constant C and a constant n, capital N, such that for all x greater than x greater than n, we have that p of x is at least cx to the n. This is small. Maybe I'll actually change this to And if like leading coefficient was negative, flip the sign. That's positive. Otherwise, you could just scan this. I have a bit of a from graph. Can you draw the graph? Uh, how with a graph? Like, like P has finite number of turning points, right? After some turning point, it will just go up. Yes, but it'll go up like this and something else could come like this. Like it's this could be, will be greater, right? a CX to the N and this could be P of X. You can just do the derivative should be, should be greater after some point. Hmm, I guess, but like you don't have to even do this. Like even a very weak bound is good enough. Can we like, assume that? Something uh, with positive leading coefficient will eventually be like, will eventually start growing unbounded. Yes. Or, or just prove it if you're not sure, if you can assume it. So like essentially, um, suppose P of X is equal to A N X to the N plus A N minus one X to the N minus one plus so on until A naught. Uh, we'll pick M to be like, much, much bigger than all coefficients to the power one million. Is that a million? I can't come. Let's hope this is. So this has the advantage that the point is x to the n is just very big. So in this case, x to the n is greater than like any coefficient to the million times x to the n minus one. 
do you see why? Sorry, just yeah. Because x is greater than y. We can induct upon the degree of polynomial. No, no, no. Just no I'm just saying like. Of, no, I'm not talking about this proof. Oh, you mean? The proof oh, mean I the said earlier. How would you induct? Like then it would reduce to c n times c to the x n minus one is smaller than or equal to like the derivative of the polynomial, which is of n minus one degree, and the leading co coefficient is c n. So we have just reduced yes. So we can induct. Uh, you want the other bound also for that? Yes, also prove that I guess there exists constant c and d. So I said P of X is also like less than DX to the N. So when we say, assume it's like something into X to the N, it's actually justified because it has the order of X to the N. So I'll just do the lower bound first and, okay, let's even do the upper bound because I, so because I'm just writing the X as X into X to the N minus one. So X to the N is clearly much bigger than these coefficients. Ah, I'm actually ending up doing the upper bound for some piece, but fine, not the point. So this means that the coefficient AI X to the I is less than X to the N for x bigger than do you does that you agree in magnitude yes yeah so if you take the sum of all of these um wait i'm not saying yes like just just sum all of them you have like n x to the n let's add in a n i think Yes, so is greater than P of X for all sufficiently large X. So we do get that there is a what have I done? Never mind. Okay, this is just a constant, yes. So we can take D equal to this. So like this just proves the upper bound that the polynomial is less than some big multiple of x to the n. And also similarly, like if you're just writing p of x as a n to the x to the n plus other stuff, this remaining stuff is a polynomial of degree at my at most n minus one. So its magnitude of this thing is like less than just i don't know e x to the n minus one for some constant e so for sufficiently large things you can just show that p is um do we just need to prove that a lower bound exists or do we need to give an algorithm to find it no no just prove that lower bound exists a n plus some epsilon into x to the power n minus one And uh, the point is just that this epsilon x to the power n is eventually just going to be much bigger than p of x minus a n x to the. In fact, like literally, a n minus epsilon for any epsilon will work for c, and similarly for d. Just anything bigger than a n will actually work. But like that's not the point. I just wanted the intuition that if you have a polynomial of degree n, it's around x to the n into some constant. Is that like clear with everyone? That if you have a polynomial, it's you can find constant such that it's greater than c x to the n and less than dx to the n. Okay, I'll assume it is. 
So uh, let's just do a problem. This is um, some of you might have seen this problem, but let's hope not. Just a second. Yes, there we go. I'll just like give you a minute to think about it and then I'll just be back. So the idea is to bound the positive integer between two values. Bound which positive integer? Like the integer that that can't be represented, and to and then just try to generate new integers. Yes, like uh, what is the like idea of the problem? Like what makes you think the problem is probably true? Like this is like degree two <clears throat> and you're taking a bunch of them together so these numbers that i that you're able to do over here are going to end up being like very big <clears throat> so you can't manage to cover every number because that would mean you have to grow like quite slowly yes Does that make sense but at, at some point it has to be like the growth has yes. to be great so if we consider how many of these let's call a number good if it's of this form <clears throat> so then let's just look fix some big number say m and let's look at how many good numbers are less than m so p has degree at least two so from what we did just previously what can we say like just assume p of n is at least what? It's greater than cx to the cn to the, the degree of the polynomial. Yeah? Yes, and we know degree is at least two, so we can say it's yes. greater than cn squared, yep. right? Yes. So this value, p of n plus one plus p of n plus two, so on until plus p of n plus k, for some constant c, it's at least c of n plus one square plus n plus two square and so on until n plus k square, right? Yes. And uh, we will just, okay, I guess we can just compute it. It's k n square plus, if I mess up, I apologize in advance.
Yeah, okay, so it's equal to this strange looking expression. Like this is just computation, and I doubt you'll even do the computation. Three, uh, three. R6. And let's just bound this quite weakly. This is greater than C into Kn square plus k cube by three. This is around k cube by three. And this is just what around k square n. Right? Yes. Plus n. Uh, the plus n we can ignore because there's an n square already. So for sufficiently large n, this is not a problem. So we know that this number is less than n. So if we're just looking at the value of n, what's the maximum value of n? Or let's actually write this as n by c is less than this. Square root m by c k. Yes. Let's not let's even ignore the k and just say n is less than the root of m by c. What can we say about k if you're just focusing on k and ignoring them? Uh, it'll be some like uh, some constant times some m to the power one by three because like this is a cubic in this. And yes. so obviously if you choose your constant large enough, you'll get the contradiction. If that yes. bound being told. So k must be at most this and n can be at most this. So every good number corresponds to like some pair n comma k. So the number of such good numbers is uh, less than, uh, I'll just write this out, q root 3m by c, which is just like some constant into m to the power 5 by 6. Does everyone agree? Where d is equal to, I guess, root 1 by c into cube root 3 by c. Wait, why is number of good numbers bounded by that? Uh, because Every good number corresponds to a choice of n comma k. Because it can be written in that form. And okay. we know that n is less than this and k is less than this. So number of pairs is at most this. So the number of good numbers is at most like constant into m to the 5 by 6. So, but the number of numbers we have are actually just n. So you obviously have infinitely many now. You have a, you have at least m minus d m to the five by six numbers. And if you take m big enough, you can get as many as you want. So you do have infinitely many such things. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay, nice. Okay, there is another thing I wanted to do, but how familiar are all of you with complex numbers? Okay, let's know enough. Yes, enough. Okay, this is probably slightly tricky. I'll put it in the piece right and write some stuff. Let's just do another problem related to size, because why not? This will be the last problem that we'll do today. Uh, no, I cannot find the statement. Right. I'll just tell the problem. Uh, P is a polynomial. of odd degree uh, 
suppose uh, there exist infinite pairs x comma y of integers such that x p of x is is equal to y p y y p of y prove that p has an integer root so like we're running a bit late already i think so i can't give too much time on this i'll probably just give the main idea and in a while just try the problem and you can just try it later too Oh, can we use complex? Uh, no, we can just directly use complex numbers here. Yes. Use complex. No, uh, complex numbers. I was referring to something else that I wanted to do. This problem does not involve complex numbers. Okay. Like, don't try to force fully use complex. If you get a proof with it, nice. But don't force. As there are infinitely many such pairs, uh, we can choose big enough integers, then py by px will be about y by x to the power of the degree into some constant. Then we can take that x, uh, this side will become n plus one in the exponent and that will be equal to one. And So if x by y, x and y are like far, then this is quite weird. Also, yes, someone mentioned this. This problem in the degree is three is 2,483. So let's just think of the problem like this. Again, the graph, this is so nice. So suppose you have this polynomial, it does stamp stuff. Okay, it does not do that. So and uh, eventually goes. Yes, I'm over here. This polynomial here is x into p of x. So what the problem is saying is that there are infinite pairs that are like at the same height, like this and this, for example. This and this would be a pair if they're both integers. So if the polynomial is like this, then here the polynomial can't be like this because this thing uh, must have even degree. So the graph actually looks kind of like this. So these pairs that we're going to have are going to be like this. So our hope, because of what the problem says, is that we want there to be infinitely many pairs at the same height such that they're integers. So if a polynomial were, what do you think must it satisfy? Suppose we have this pair x1, y1, x2, y2, and these x, i, y are like very huge. We're considering only beyond a point because we have like, like it's odd after some point of interval. It's odd. It's even. 
yes even even uh, after some point of inter yeah uh, also it's not even even means that you have p of x equal to p of minus no 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 i'm not saying for all x like after some interval of x yes you actually don't have even you have that p of x is actually equal to or not p i'm okay I'm, i should clarify i'm letting q of x is equal to x p of x so actually the claim is that there exists some constant c such that integer c in fact q of x is equal to q of c minus x in which case all the pairs are of the form like x i c minus x i x2 c minus x2 and so on so it makes sense that this kind of polynomial would work like why there needs to be an integer can't it be just like a uh, we claim a this. real number okay oh we want x1 plus y1 to be equal to c we know that one such a real number would work because if it doesn't then we won't have a a, uh, a turning point down there no, this is not a turning point this means uh, the q is symmetric about like to have such symmetry we should have a turning point yes but like this kind of graph is also has such a thing it's symmetric about this line but it but has a turning point right this graph also has turning point yes yes that's a... yeah, it must have. so times almost up i'll probably end so i'll just mention the idea is to prove the existence of such a c by showing that this sum xi plus yi is bounded so that it takes finitely many values because if even one sum is taken infinitely many times then you have that q of x equal to that constant minus x has infinitely many solutions so it's an identity and this showing that this is bounded is actually just algebra and once you get that this is true we have that x p of x is equal to c minus x into q of c p of c minus x so p of x has c is a root of p of x and even when c is zero this still is valid because then zero becomes a root of p Uh, what is x i plus y i? Uh, the pairs such that q of x one q is equal to q of y one, q of y two is equal to uh, q of x two is equal to q of y two, and so on. So we're just looking at the sums of those things, and we're trying to show that it's bounded. So it's like at most something, and at least something. Okay. because the intuition is that eventually this becomes like not there is no such uh what do you say like abnormalities it's just like the polynomial the polynomial for sufficiently large values is just very nice so if you had some polynomial that suppose you zoomed out and it looked like the same so if you want such a thing to be true you would expect it to like be symmetric about some point and that's what this is saying that q of x is equal to q of c minus x so in that way it's kind of a natural claim and yeah after you get the claim it's just doing some algebra and computation and it works so i guess that's all if there's any like specific doubt about something i did today or just any general doubt about polynomials go ahead and ask
I'll assume not then. I'm ending the recording.